welcome to Ipsa Dixit, a podcast on legal scholarship. I'm your host, Brian L. Fry, Spears Gilbert Associate Professor of Law at the University of Kentucky College of Law. My guest is Mark J. Rondotza, a First Amendment and intellectual property attorney. We will discuss his article, The Freedom to Film Pornography, which was published in the Nevada Law Journal, as well as related issues. So welcome to the show, Mark. Thank you. Really fun to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you on. I'm really excited to talk to you about this fascinating paper and all the work that you've done in in this area. Uh, but for listeners who might not be familiar with you and and your work, I wonder if we could start by just having you talk a little bit about what you do and why you are, dare I say, uh, uniquely qualified to speak on this subject. <laughs> Well, I don't know if I'm uniquely qualified. There's some people, but I, you know, I was joking before. The reason I got into porn, I was young and I needed the money. Um, but no, it's, uh, you know, when I, I am, uh, I guess every First Amendment lawyer has an origin story. And when I sit around having, you know, drinks or bong hits with other, uh, other First Amendment lawyers, I like to ask them what theirs are. And, and we all have a, have a, a, a moment. I, I call him my quit hassle in me, man story, because um, I think for young people, you never realize how much your First Amendment rights are infringed upon until the moment you learn about them. And then within 24 hours of learning about them, you usually find yourself offended at some at some infringement. So I had a crazy, crazy like a social studies teacher in high school who was explaining to us all of these things that, uh, that, that, you know, had been done under the auspices of the American flag, you know, and said, you know, you really want to salute that? We were talking about flag burning. And I said, well, you know, I still don't agree with that, but I don't really like the idea of saluting the flag. So it feels like compelled speech. It feels really weird. You know, I, I, I can agree with the constitution. If you put the constitution up there, I'd salute it, but I'm not going to pledge allegiance to a piece of cloth. And he said, well, you don't have to. Said, Great. So the next day in homeroom, I stayed seated. This is long before, I think, before Colin Kaepernick was even born. And, uh, you know, and it was, I was commanded that I would do it. And I said, I, I don't have to. And uh, that led to a lot of trouble for me. And that led to me being sent down to the principal's office and spending a lot of time there and getting screamed at. And uh, there were even teachers who uh, expressly authorized other students to kick my ass for it. So I got my ass kicked for this. And frankly, I probably would have backed down. But once I bled for it, uh, well, you know, fuck you. I'm, now I bled for it. <laughs> now I'm not backing down. Um, and I never did. I spent the rest of the year fighting that. Um, and so off to, off to college, I go where I decide I'm going to do the, uh, you know, what, what do I want to major in? I said, well, journalism, that's a great place for somebody who thinks they want to stick up for the first amendment. And, um, you know, I spent seven years getting my journalism degree, um, mostly because, uh, you know, while while I was studying journalism, I was simultaneously getting a major in, uh, I guess we could say, recreational horticulture and female anatomy. Um, <laughs> and so, uh, you know, I flunked out three times, and uh, I came back after really losing sight of everything through all the acid, and uh, and I got got back to school, and I took a First Amendment class with a professor, Karen List, and I was really into it and really participated. It was a new experience for me. And, um, and then on my first exam, I got a 30 out of 100, which is uh, not a passing grade, not even at UMass. And um, Karen grabbed me in the hallway and threw me against the wall and said, you're the smartest fucking person I've ever had in my class, and you just flunked my exam. Now, you're going to get your shit together. I don't know what your problem is, but you're going to recover from it. You're going to get it done. You're going to get an A in this course, and you're going to start to be a good student. And I'm sitting there stunned, you know, with my mohawk and my leather jacket up against the wall. And, uh, and I'm thinking, huh, I'm smart. I didn't know that. 
Uh, I didn't know that until somebody told me that, you know, kids are that way. So that really got me kind of on the First Amendment kick. Um, fast forward to law school where they, you know, strangle all of that idealism out of you. And, um, and then I figured out that I couldn't be a First Amendment lawyer and, and make more money than it would take, you know, than I would make maybe returning bottles and cans to the store. Um, and I, I got kind of tied up in the idea that I had to work for a big firm and, you know, and have an expense account and make money and all that. So I, I, I went to a firm where I did condominium association law. And you haven't lived until you're sitting there with your Georgetown law degree and you're, you're writing a, a letter to Mrs. Finkelbaum about allowing her dog to defecate on the common elements of uh, Del Boca Vista phase four. So I have a library of dog shit letters. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll never forget the very first thing I, I did when I got sworn in as a Florida attorney was my boss handed me a file and he said, well, now you're sworn in in Florida and you can now uh, represent your client's rights and educate them on their responsibilities. So here's your first task. And I had to write a memo on the uh, legal consequences of baby shit in a trailer park pool. And uh, <laughs> yeah, so I, I dove into it. I wrote a hell of a long memo with citations and everything and learned more about baby shit and pools than you could ever want to know. And it was known as the infamous baby shit memo. And then one day my boss took me out to lunch and said, uh, you know, him and the partners at that office, he said, we get the impression you don't really like your job. So and I'm like, geez, we'll we give you that idea. Um, but they, they told me to go take a vacation and think about what I really wanted to do. And uh, in the meantime, I picked up a, a dirty bookstore as a client. And I was like, yeah, man. This is why I went to law school. Like, look at all, remember all these cool cases that I studied, you know? And Jesus, just before I went to law school, I went and saw the People versus Larry Flint and said, that's what I want to be when I grow up. And Jesus, where did I lose track of all that? And um, so I come back in, you know, really happy because I picked up this dirty bookstore as a client. And I said, look, man, yeah, I like my job. Look, I got this client. And they said, well, we don't really want to be known for that. I was like, shit. You know, so I, uh, I, I, took my, uh, I took my one client and went and found another firm that did First Amendment law exclusively and uh, took a whopper of a pay cut and a whopper of a prestige cut. You know, I went from, being, uh, from getting you know, luxury box tickets to football games and, and you know, having two secretaries to uh, sharing a paralegal in a, in a strip mall where it said law office above the door. And and I had never been happier, you know, and I started working on uh, working on these kinds of cases, primarily for strip clubs and adult bookstores. And then, uh, you know, and then the then Internet porn really started to get big. And all of these little companies that were just, you know, just starting out came to us for advice. And so I started working on a lot of those issues. And then uh, and then, you know, and then uh, and then. Bush got elected, and um, I, if I had known how good George W. Bush and, and John Ashcroft were going to be for my income potential, I probably would have donated to their camp to, to the Bush campaign. Um, but you know, I went from driving a Ford Focus to buying a Porsche cash because every porn company in America was terrified that they were going to go to jail um, because. During the Ashcroft uh, regime and the, during the Bush Bush one uh, Bush two regime, uh, you actually had a lot of people get prosecuted for and go to to jail for obscenity, and you know that was really kind of scary from a First Amendment time that it, Americans going to jail because the government didn't like their movies. Um, you know we really were we were fighting these uh, those battles as well as battles in all of these towns and, and counties that were trying to legislate adult bookstores out of existence, trying to get rid of strip clubs. And then of course the porn companies, I mean, it was just, it was just fantastic. It was a, it was a real bonanza of first amendment issues to deal with. Um, so that's really how I got my start in it. Uh, you know, from there, of course you have, 
once once you start doing that kind of First Amendment law, you know, you are uh, you are tagged as the porn lawyer. So, um, you know, none of those none of those respectable firms that have you write dog shit letters uh, really want you back. So um, so here I am. And uh, and and funny enough. Uh, I've really managed to to make a good practice of it, uh, in a practice where I meet a lot of super interesting people and deal with a lot of super interesting things. So my understanding is that you represent many uh, companies that produce pornographic films. I, I have, but uh, you know, like any other industry, um, there's been a lot of consolidation. So, um, you know, I have. Uh, I, I do and have uh, more in the past, but now that they've all sort of bought each other up and gobbled each other up, it's it's less. But yeah, webcam companies, um, adult uh, adult bookstores, webcam companies, porn producers, um, you know, sex toy companies. I mean, you, you name it. And it uh, it's really been funny because it's it's a lot. A lot of it has come from. In fact, most of my work comes from. Other lawyers get a call and they say, my firm can't touch this, but I know a guy and, and I am that guy. So the, the paper that, that you sent me, which was really fascinating, was really focused on the sort of legal regime governing the production of pornographic filmmaking, especially in relation to laws arguably potentially prohibiting the creation of these kinds of films. And among other things, you note in the article that a lot of people think it's only legal to film pornographic movies in California and New Hampshire. Why is that? Well, that, that, that comes from a case called uh, People versus Freeman, where there was a creative California prosecutor who decided he was going to be a hero to the anti-porn forces by saying, hey, all these porn productions are actually prostitution because you're paying somebody to have sex. That's what prostitution is. So I don't have to worry about the First Amendment here. I'm just enforcing the prostitution laws. So he charged Mr. Freeman with pandering, and uh, this went up to the California Supreme Court, which held – that it is not uh, something that you can prosecute for two independent reasons. Now, the first reason was that it doesn't fit the prostitution statute. So California and a number of other states have prostitution statutes, which say you can't pay someone for sexual gratification. Well, if I'm paying you to be in a porn movie, I'm not paying you for sexual gratification. I'm paying you for sexual conduct. But it's not – I'm not getting my jollies off, so I'm not getting gratified. Therefore, uh, even if I do enjoy my work, I'm not involved in prostitution. The second rationale, they said, was that even if the legislature amends the, the statute so it fits, it would run afoul of the First Amendment because how else can you make porn? You simply – it would be a de facto ban on a certain kind of content, which would run afoul of the First Amendment. Now, California appealed that to the U.S. Supreme Court, but uh, the Supreme Court said uh, we're not taking this case because even if we were to rule against you on the uh, – even if we were to rule that the First Amendment argument from the California Supreme Court was incorrect, that would not change the outcome of this case because we have no right to overrule the California Supreme Court on the interpretation of its prostitution statute. So California versus Freeman stands as solid constitutional protection in California for the production of pornography. Now, people think that's why Porn Valley is there. People think that's why there's so much porn production in California. That's got nothing to do with it. I mean, porn was being shot in California for decades uh, before California versus Freeman. But with that case sitting there, there was at least the argument that the only state that had explicitly ruled that you can shoot porn there and you have absolutely no possibility of getting prosecuted was California. Nevertheless, uh, that didn't stop 
porn productions from springing up all over the place, especially once you didn't need expensive cameras, you know, once everything got democratized with webcams and, uh, you know, and, and home editing equipment. Arizona has a big industry. Florida has a huge porn industry. Um, you know, in, in fact, most of the country, there are very few places where somebody's not making porn. And with the advent of uh, webcam sites, which I also represent, uh, you've got porn ha production happening literally everywhere. Um, so now fast forward to New Hampshire. Um, a New Hampshire prosecutor decided he would try Freeman on his own. And there was nothing, no other case challenged this notion anywhere else. And I think it was because there was this really nice equilibrium. I represented a client, for example, in Florida, who a prosecutor said, well, I'm going to charge your client with prostitution. And I said, well, have you seen California versus Freeman? He says, yes, but that's not binding here, so I'm not really worried about it. He said, I'm, I'm going to be the one to overturn that. And I said, okay, here are your choices. You can file this, this, these charges against my client. We defend on Freeman grounds. And if we win, you have just ensured that Florida is a free fire zone for porn production. And if I lose... It's only binding in this district. So you really have nothing to gain. So either my client's going to win and you have to go back to your church next week and say, I'm the guy that made it that Florida has a constitutional decision that says you can film porn here that's, that's explicit, um, sorry, explicit on the law, not explicit on the content, um, or you can let it go. So there was this nice equilibrium. Now, in New Hampshire, there was a case where a guy was in uh, working at the courthouse in New Hampshire, and he heard a couple that was having a little trouble paying a, a traffic fine. So he said, uh, well, you know, why don't you guys meet me down the street at this hotel, and I'll film you guys. Uh, if, you know, I'll film you guys for 50 bucks an hour to, uh, to have sex with each other on camera. And, uh, you know, maybe that'll help you with your financial problems. It was eminently more creepy than Freeman. Um, and, and I think, at least factually, one could argue that this was, this was maybe him paying for gratification. You know, he just wanted to watch these two screw. Um, but there was no evidence that his offer was anything other than good, clean American porn production. Um, so the New Hampshire Supreme Court held that under the New Hampshire Constitution, which is stronger than the First Amendment, uh, they could not prosecute this. So it was essentially a mirror of, uh, of Freeman, except they relied on the New Hampshire Constitution instead of the First Amendment. So these are really the only two places that you have an explicit Supreme Court of that state ruling that there is nothing a prosecutor can do. That does not mean that's the only place that you can legally shoot porn. So that's that's where this uh, you know that that's where this myth comes from. So there's still a lot of people in 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 you know even in the porn industry who believe they can only shoot in California and New Hampshire. And frankly, I've you know I've even seen lawyers in the industry promote that myth, uh, but it, it simply isn't true, as I explain in the paper. Yeah, I mean, in a lot of ways, it seems like a kind of like dog that didn't bark type scenario. I mean, <clears throat> I mean, my takeaway from the paper was at least in part that like, you know, yes, we have these sort of binding precedents on point in these two states. But at the same time, it seems like it, as a practical matter, the authorities in other states aren't really willing or don't think they're able as a practical, you know, in any meaningful sense to sort of prevent people from uh, engaging in the production of pornographic films. It, 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 am I right to kind of get that sense as a takeaway? Yeah. I mean, there have been, um, you know, I, I looked at a number of states on this. Um, for example, in, uh, in New York, there actually is a, at least a trial court decision on it that really showed it as as being obvious 
Although there, there was a case that said porn is prostitution there. Uh, it just didn't last very long. Um, Arizona, it, it is safe, uh, although Arizona prosecutors have in the past tried to make, you know, tried, tried to get rhetorical about it, you know, said publicly they're, they're going to do something about it, but they never have. Um, you know, Oregon, uh, Oregon is just a crazy fantastic place as far as uh, sexual liberation when it comes to its Supreme Court jurisprudence. I mean, Oregon has, uh, Oregon's uh, Supreme Court has ruled that even live sex shows are protected under the First Amendment. And it is the only state where uh, proximity rule at a strip club was deemed to be unconstitutional. And these cases were, were always kind of fun to argue, but very disappointing that they were just unwinnable. Um, where a local municipality or a local or a state would say, you know, we can't outright ban strip clubs. But what we can do is make it so difficult for them to operate that they're just not profitable. Well, one way you do that is you ban lap dances because lap dances are, you know, hell, that's most of the fun in a strip club. So you make it that you can't touch each other. Well, all right, no lap dances. Well, what about getting really close to somebody? I mean, the closer you are to a, uh, you know, a naked person that you're attracted to, the more they're going to be able to take your money away from you. Uh, I, at least, you know, your mileage may vary, but I usually come home feeling like I've been mugged. Um, but you know, you, you 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 give over your money. But if the but if the girl's you know 15 feet away from you. It's a little difficult to throw $20 bills at her, make, tell her not to leave again. Um, well, I argued in, in, in before, the, before this uh, decision in, in Oregon, how is that not a violation of the First Amendment? I mean, just think about like, uh, hell, a hula dance. I mean, you don't have to be naked. I mean, somebody in this establishment, how do you put a lay around somebody's neck? Yeah, no pun intended. Or... Uh, you know, a Mardi Gras. How do you put Mardi Gras beads on somebody from, from 12 feet away? Um, there's really a communicative aspect to dance, to erotic dance, that I think is protected by the First Amendment. And every single time uh, that argument got shot down in flames. So it's one of my, uh, one of my many uh, expansive interpretation of the First Amendment arguments that has been proven to be utterly unpersuasive to the judiciary. But uh, a really smart lawyer by the name of Lake Paraguay, uh, one of my heroes, argued this same thing in Oregon, and the Oregon Supreme Court said that he was right. Uh, and so under the Oregon Constitution, you can't even have a constitutional proximity rule uh, in, in a strip club. So, you know, really, in every state you look at, there is some reason Ab over and above just the federal constitutional issue, which I would like to say would be upheld, um, but even over and above that, if you look at your state, if, you're, if your state prostitution statute says sexual gratification, that's not going to encompass porn production. And even if it says sexual contact, like Florida and Arizona do, uh, there's either a state reason, a state constitutional prohibition or um, there's simply just no stomach to create one. Um, you know, the, the most interesting place, I think, for all of this is Nevada, uh, which is where my main office is. Because in Nevada, we had a California, most of our laws in, in Nevada are, are kind of taken from California, or, or, big, or big sibling to the, uh, to the West. So the prostitution statute was identical to Freeman, uh, to the one in Freeman. And it stood like that for years, and nobody ever questioned whether or not you could prosecute porn production in Nevada. And then people started flowing into Nevada to move porn production from California to Nevada, uh, because California started really taking shots at the porn industry again, uh, namely in the condom wars, they were trying to force porn companies to use condoms in their films. And uh, that was really unpopular. Um, it was unpopular uh, both with audiences um, and, and strangely enough, uh, you know, women are really rapidly growing market for porn. You know, now that you don't have to go into a creepy 
movie theater with a raincoat on to watch it. You can watch it in the comfort of your own home. Uh, women are consuming tons of it. Well, women hate condoms in porn more than anybody. Like it just, it, I mean, the, re, the responses were angry from women about it. Um, but then also the, the actresses themselves were against it. Now, I was hired to go lobby um, against the law in California. And I sat down with a room of actresses uh, and I said, look, just between you and me, why would you guys be against this? I mean, to me, it didn't, didn't really make any sense. It was kind of like telling construction workers, uh, you have to wear a hard hat and the construction workers saying, hell no, we don't want that safety gear on us. <clears throat> and, um, you know, and, and uh, not having a vagina of my own, um, you know, there were some intricacies of it that I did not apparently learn in college. And these girls explained to me that, you know, condoms are not an industrial product. They are not designed for the kind of sex you have on camera. I mean, sex on camera, if you ever watched, uh, pe a lot of people think because of my job, it must be so much fun to go to a porn shoot and watch it. And anytime I've had a friend ask me, hey, can you, can you get me on this set? I say to them, I say, just look, stay gold, pony boy. You, you, you don't want to see how your sausages are made, your laws are made, or how your porn is made. Uh, it, it, will, it will absolutely ruin it, and you'll wind up in the corner sucking your thumb, calling for your mother. Um, the, the, it, it's horrible to watch. Um, it is, you know, and it's a lot of stop, stops and starts. And, I mean, it'll go on for hours, one scene that you're trying to shoot exactly right. And um, if you can imagine, you know, most people are, uh, you know, let's just let's just be very generous to everybody listening and say, you know, your that condom is going to last you is, you know, is going to you're not going to need it for more than 15 minutes. Right. But it is certainly not designed to last for four hours. And so it causes abrasions and then it'll break. And so. Every porn actress that I talked to said she would rather have testing than condoms because the condoms cause immense discomfort, microabrasions, which then make disease transmission more likely. So, you know, strangely enough, condoms make them less safe. And I found that a really, really interesting update on my uh, uh, vagina knowledge. So with all these companies moving to Nevada, um, you know, there was a little bit of discomfort among not that many people in Nevada, because Nevada has always been a little everything, you know, anything goes state, uh, a lot more tolerant than uh, anywhere else I've been in the world, except maybe Amsterdam. Um, but then there was an anti-human trafficking bill that passed in Nevada, or was up for, for passage in Nevada, I should say. And I didn't even take a look at it until it was up at a, at a committee hearing and I looked at it and I said, wait a minute, in this 70 odd page bill, there's one line in it that changes our prostitution statute from a sexual gratification to sexual contact statute. Now, why are you sticking in the mid that in the middle of a 70 page bill? And I thought, boy, that's, that's going to be a problem. And I had a number of clients from California, and I'm not even being hyperbolic when I said they, they were literally loading up moving vans to move to Nevada. And this was when Nevada was in a lot of trouble after the, uh, the last economic downturn. So any jobs you could bring into Nevada were a big deal. And uh, so I ran down to the legislature and went to a, a public hearing, and they brought out the anti-human trafficking bill and just... Dozens of people stood up to praise the legislature for it, and then I, uh, and then they said, "Okay, well, is uh, we presume nobody is here against the bill," and then I raised my hand, and you know everybody starts rolling their eyes. It's like, "Okay, Mr. Randaza, what's your problem with this human trafficking bill?" You know, meanwhile, it had been like every manner of person standing up. You know, they had priests, rabbis. Druids and stuff. I mean, any anybody who could say any any form of God bless you to them had blessed the legislature for this. And I brought up this one little change, and I said, this one little change has caused me on the way here to call two clients who are packing their ba their their bags right now to move to Nevada, telling them 
this is an indication to me that Nevada intends to harass the porn industry that moves here. And I am not letting my clients move here if this is still in there. And um, to the credit of the open-mindedness of the Nevada legislature, uh, they changed it. And they, they put in the legislative history that they were changing it to accommodate the freedom of the porn industry to shoot in Nevada. So you, if, if anybody tried to prosecute you in Nevada for making porn, you would have a, uh, a very, very strong argument against that. You mentioned earlier in the interview that there was a period, especially during the the George W. Bush administration, where there was a lot of prosecution or an increase in prosecution for obscenity in relation to pornographic films. How, if at all, do you see that intersecting with the kind of broader question that you are addressing in this paper about producing pornographic films at all? In other words, do you see the obscenity issue and the pornographic film production issue as being part of the same question or as being different questions? They're really different questions, but under the same umbrella. Look, there are people who... uh, you know, who are uh, what I've heard described as erotophobic, right? There are people who believe that, you know, for religious reasons, that pornography is evil. There are people who believe it for social reasons. Uh, You know, there is a, I mean, there's a very strong tradition of feminist scholarship that says that all pornography is hate speech against women to make it very simple. Um, I've, I've always had a little, difficulty reconciling that with gay porn but you know there's there's at least plenty of law review articles way more law review articles supporting that than against it let's put it that way um so there are always people who are going to be creeped out by sex it's going to make them uncomfortable and those people when they get into power they don't just set aside their hang-ups you bring all your hang-ups when you get into power so i think it's it's more of a a really strange American uh, obsession with erotophobia in in the context of, of, of ordered liberty. I mean, when I tell my friends in Europe uh, that I primarily do work for porn companies, you know, they say, well, why, why do porn companies need a lawyer? And they say, well, they want to, you know, restrict them for this. And, and meanwhile, you'll be walking past a porno shop that's right next to a Catholic church there, and nobody thinks thinks anything of it. Um, you know, not to say that there aren't other places that you could have a big problem, right? You know, you certainly don't want to be selling porn in, in Jordan or Saudi Arabia. We're not, we're not the worst. But we have this strange Venn diagram of, uh, of, of, uh, of a desire for complete freedom. We have this libertarian streak along with an authoritarian streak and, a, and an imposition of morality streak that – once in a while, those beams cross, and it's a uh, it's a really interesting time for a uh, for a First Amendment lawyer. I guess the question I have around that is sort of like, what do you see as being the kind of the future of the legal regulation of of pornography, both from a federal and and state perspective? I mean, in in the paper, you sort of at least on my reading, sort of illuminate this kind of detente almost, as it were, like as if states have sort of acknowledged that they're very unlikely to be successful with prohibition of the production of of pornographic films. But do you see that shifting to a more kind of, as it were, explicit sort of in endorsement or at least explicit understanding that this is protected speech. Um, I mean, among other things, you point to kind of the increase in sort of explicit regulation of the industry. Do you see those as kind of being tied together and potentially like reflecting a future reconciliation to the legality of this form of speech? I don't think you'll ever have a complete reconciliation because I think, you know, just just by operation of society, I think you're always going to have a percentage of people who have a problem with porn production. 
you know, no matter how libertine we become. Um, but I think that the culture war over pornography, uh, I, I don't want to prematurely declare victory in it, um, but I think it's, it's we're, we're in mopping up operations now. Um, but on both sides, because the, the war for, for example, regulation of brick and mortar pornography businesses has been won by the censors. Uh, they have either, you know, they're the adverse secondary effects doctrine, which which allows regulation of of uh, brick and mortar businesses. Uh, as long as you're not doing it because it's porn, you're doing it because of some other reason, has been expanded so broadly by the Supreme Court and and subordinate courts that if you have almost any excuse other than I don't want porn in my town, um, as long as that's not in the record you're probably going to win. And in a lot of cases, uh, the adult businesses that challenged those regulations you know, more than a decade ago made deals with the local municipalities that they would drop their lawsuits if the municipality gave them 10 years to operate and then they'd agree to shut down after 10 years or, or some, t some cases less, some cases more. So really, you, know, you, you find that there are a lot fewer strip clubs now a lot fewer adult bookstores, uh, and then the adult bookstores that still exist, they aren't really the, you know, the Raincoat Charlie type places. They're not really the, you know, they're, they're sort of places that you'll find bachelorette parties going to more than you'll find, you know, lonely, strange men walking around outside. Um, on the other hand, you know, on the other hand, uh, as far as production of adult films, I just don't see any stomach in prosecutors' offices for going after that anymore. I mean, for the eight years of the Obama administration, there wasn't a single prosecution. And, uh, you know, Trump has not prosecuted any either. So I just, I just think that everybody's sort of at a place where the battle lines are, are there. You know, it's maybe like a, a World War I trench warfare situation. Nobody's going to move now. Uh, the, the territory that's been staked out has been taken. Um, but, you know, there's always little little skirmishes about it. You know, for example, like the, the PPP loans, the Small Business Administration back in 1995 uh, under the Clinton administration, uh, the SBA made it that you couldn't get an SBA loan if you produced uh, adult content or had any connection to the adult industry. And that was blatantly unconstitutional, but no one challenged it until this year when the PPP loans came out and the application explicitly wouldn't even let you proceed if you clicked that you produce prurient content. Uh, that was struck down in at least two courts so far. So really the, the regulation of, of adult content has, uh, you know, has come to little obscure provisions of the law like that. Um, you know, registration of adult trademarks, for example, was largely prohibited. Uh, and then the, the Mattal versus Tam case in the Supreme Court struck that down. So, you know, I, I think where we are now is uh, porn has become so mainstream now that, I mean, how many times do you watch a mainstream television show that will at least reference somebody's porn habits? Um you know, even in a in just a cheeky and, and happy way, um, you know, I hope everybody. I mean, I tr I don't have a very burgeoning estates and trust practice, but I do tell everybody, part of your part of your estate plan should be to have a browser deletion buddy, uh, you know, who'll go and delete your browser history once they say you're dead, um, or preferably burn your hard drive, or hey, if you want to just let your freak flag fly at your funeral. Uh, I'm going to leave instructions to play everything you can find on my uh, on my browser history at my funeral, but uh, you know I'm a, I'm an unusual character, so um, but you know it's it's really just not it's not the kind of thing that people are afraid of anymore. I mean it's I mean let's let, let's face it what what a lot of people act like in in public now is something that would have been at least R-rated a generation ago. So we, we've become more accepting of it to the point that I think you'd have a very hard time fielding a jury almost anywhere who would say that you should go to prison uh, for, for a porn movie unless it's something just so extreme that 
uh, you know, that it would even give me nightmares. Well, so in closing, Mark, I mean, I feel like for really both of our lifetimes, pornography and the kind of adult industry have been at the forefront of First Amendment jurisprudence in a lot of contexts, sort of pushing First Amendment law forward. Um, what do you see going forward? Do you think that the porn industry is going to still be occupying that role in the future? Or is it your sense that in, in some sense they've kind of won? No, the, the, I think the porn wars are largely over. Um, you know, on, <clears throat> on my wall in my office, uh, you know, I have uh, my homage to the, to the heroes of freedom of expression, you know, starting with Diogenes as the most, uh, you know, Diogenes, the, the cynic as the oldest one, Galileo, Oliver Wendell Holmes, uh, the uh, cover from Charlie Hebdo, uh, Lenny Bruce, and the Campariad. Uh, that was at issue in Hustler versus Falwell. And I think that, you know, the, the really interesting, the days of the very interesting sexual expression cases leading the way for, for protection of freedom, uh, I think are done. And, and I, but, you know, your, your question alludes to a fact that I think everybody should remember is that we, uh, if you think you're free now, uh, you do have you have pornography to thank for that, um, j just as much as you have pornography to thank for if you watch your news broadcasts uh, on on uh, on the internet uh, and uh, anything that you pay for that you might buy on online shopping. Uh, there was a very long time when the only way you could make money on the internet was uh, if if you were selling porn, and those technologies and those liberties were both. You know, the porn industry was at the at the spearhead of that, but. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I just don't see without a, a massive regression in what we consider to be liberty. Uh, I don't see that happening. And, you know, we've so far, it seems to be a bipartisan uh, uh, declaration of peace. You know, I was really uh, both fearful um, when Jeff Sessions was made attorney general because he's a notorious anti porn crusader. Um, you know, I was also thinking, hey, maybe it's time to start buying some more very nice things because Jeff Sessions is going to be great for business. Uh, and he wasn't. And, you know, the Trump, if if you have two administrations so vastly diverse as the, uh, I, I don't think you can have any two administrations more polar opposite than Obama and Trump. And if neither the Obama administration, um, you know, with its, with, with the kind of people that it put in power, nor the Trump administration, the kind of people that it favors, nobody has really picked up that baton that, uh, that John Ashcroft left on the side of the road. Uh, I don't think anybody will. So, uh, yeah, on, on behalf of the porn industry, I, I declare victory. <laughs> All hail porn, I guess. Uh, well, Mark, thanks so much for coming on the show. This is a really fascinating conversation. It was great to hear about your work in this area of the law and your representation of, of these, of these clients. It's my pleasure. And I saw a girl, I wanted to make my own true love, yes I did She was a bunny in a little pink costume, the prettiest girl I've ever seen oh, With the two pink rabbit ears are sticking up, I said, huh, that's the girl for me But the problem was, how to pick her up, when every guy in the place had tried Last night I fell, head over heels in love, with a swinging bunny, at the Playboy Club yeah, 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 yeah. She came to a table and said, can I take your order? I said, yeah. I said, bring me half a dozen swinging little bunnies like you. I was trying to be cute. She said, we're here to serve the customers and to lend some atmosphere. But if there's anything else that you have in mind, well, mister, you can't get it here. 
as she put me down. So I thought I'd try a little white lie. Once again, I sized up the girl and I figured she wanted to be an actress. So I said, I'm a talent scout and you ought to be in the movies. I mean it. She said, you really didn't think so, mister? To tell the truth, I think so too. <laughs> But if you really were a talent scout, you wouldn't come on like you do. You see, she could spot a phony. <laughs> I've been called that before. But how I love that girl. Last night I fell. Last night I fell. Head over heels in love. Head over heels in love. With a swinging bun With a swinging bun Yeah, Playboy Club Yeah, hear yeah, me now well, I still had a few things left in my bag of tricks So I thought I'd lay my cards directly on the line Yes, I would I said I know a lot of guys try to pick you up And I guess I'm trying to So let's cut out all this Mickey Mouse And let me go out with you Well, she kind of smiled and Said I like your style But it's against the rules Last night I fell 